I had the great honour in the last years of Margaret Thatcher's life of getting to know her very well. I used to visit her pretty much every Sunday evening at her home in Chester Square and talk to her about what was going on in Britain and in the world in that week. She used to have next to her a book by Robin Harris with the title The President, the Pope and the Prime Minister, the three who changed the world. Margaret occasionally said they got the order wrong, but she didn't disagree with the sentiment. <laughs> Late in the year before she died, I took a taxi from the House of Commons to visit her in Chester Square and ask the taxi driver to drop me in Chester Square. He said, which end of the square do you want, Gov? I said, the house of the policeman outside. He said, Maggie Thatcher's Gov. I said, that's right. So what are you going there for, then? I said, I'm going to have a drink with her. So how do you know her, then? Said, well, I'm a Tory MP. She's a friend of mine. And when we got there, he refused to take the fare. I tried to give him the money. He said, your fare tonight, Gov, is you go in there and you tell her from me, we ain't had a good and since. I told that story on the floor of the House of Commons with the Prime Minister sitting on the front bench in the tribute session. Uh, I have to say he laughed, but in a funny way. Uh, so I would like to give you, or thank you for giving me the opportunity to stand at a dispatch box, which is not something I expect to have in, real, uh, in the House of Commons anytime soon. A couple of years ago, Tony Abbott, leader of the opposition in Australia, got in touch, his office got in touch to ask could he go to see her. 22 years after she had left office, people were still coming the world over to be inspired by what Margaret Thatcher did as Prime Minister. A friend of mine got in touch, a school friend, I hadn't heard from him since we were at school shortly after she died and I was doing a bit of media. And he emailed me and he said, I've seen you on the television quite a lot in recent days. He said, I well remember at school how you had a picture of Maggie in your locker. He said, I had Kylie Minogue. He said, you've clearly had more success in getting to know your idol than I had mine. But ladies and gentlemen, I think the one thing the two front benches can agree is this was a significant and towering political figure in British political history. When you go into Parliament and you stand in members' lobby and you see there are only four prime ministers immortalised in statue form, two who led Britain in world wars in the 20th century, and Clement Attlee and Margaret Thatcher, arguably the only two who used office to fundamentally try and change the country they were governing. She will go down in history as one of the greats, and I will argue, for good. Mr Nabarro talked about his generation and the debt. He was absolutely right. Mr Blair's generation, Mr Blair's government has betrayed your generation. And I say this to all of you. Demand of all politicians today, on all sides, the candour and honesty of Margaret Thatcher, who if she were here today would be explaining to your generation that interest, interest in serving the national debt is now the fourth largest claimant on the public purse each year. That is utterly unsustainable and Margaret Thatcher would not have allowed that position to continue. Mr Nabarro has a distinguished career ahead of him if he puts in performances like that to blame her for malnutrition, suicide and gross inequality. In her final question time, a Labour member of Parliament stood up and with great enthusiasm and attacked her on her record. And she stood up and said to him, and I would say it to Mr Nabarro tonight, the honourable gentleman always was quite a good advocate. He could speak to any brief and I don't believe he believed a word of that. As far as Mr Hanley is concerned, well, I would just say this. It is a great shame that Ken Livingstone can't be with us tonight. But we are grateful to Ken for sending you his script and his speaking points. <laughs> uh, Dennis Skinner, that lovable old Labour rogue, has announced his retirement at the next general election. Mr Hanley, stick your name in. You'd be very welcome to replace him in Bolsover. If it is wrong of Margaret Thatcher 
to sink the Belgrano, to save the lives of our boys when that ship was zigzagging, then you live in a very strange world indeed. And the point about gay rights, I'll just say this, if Margaret Thatcher was homophobic or anti-gay, it is very strange indeed that in her final years, her visitor on a Sunday evening was an openly gay man. She was much more enlightened than the record that you put before us. You talked about how she reinforced the structures that kept her in power. Absolutely she did. She reinforced democracy and believed passionately in general elections. She reinforced the structures of democracy and the people kept re-electing her. You talked about the poll tax. Margaret was very clear herself. It was the community charge, not the poll tax. She was a great fan of the Polish people and would never have tried to tax them. <laughs> uh, And as for the professor, I am still deeply confused as to which side of the motion he was speaking for. I, I'm sure it's out of order, Madam President. Perhaps a chair could be put somewhere in the middle, because I felt he was very much on the one hand, on the other hand, in his approach. Not the approach of one of his students who's currently working in my office, who lived under the socialism in East Europe that she liberated and helped liberate them from, who is a massive fan. Margaret once said, if you get your judgment of human nature right, your politics will follow. She believed passionately that wealth was created by individual citizens determined to improve theirs and their families' lot. That the wealth of nations, and she reminded us that Adam Smith spoke of the wealth of nations as well as the wealth of individuals. The wealth of nations was built on the boundless energies and talents of millions of free people. And she reinforced the point that it was by that individual effort that the nation as a whole was enriched when she said, a man may climb Everest for himself, but at the summit he plants his country's flag. There was no mention on the other side of the millions who bought their own home and suddenly had their own identity and wealth to pass on to future generations. Nothing about the fact that there were more shareholders, people owning a stake in businesses, than there were trade unions, unionists at the end of her time. Nothing about the tens of thousands of people, many of whom used to come up and thank her at receptions, saying, you gave me the opportunity to start my own business under the Enterprise Allowance Scheme. Margaret Thatcher saved Britain quite literally. And I would urge you tonight to vote with those who accorded her more votes at her third election than she got at her first. They agreed she saved Britain. The world agreed she saved Britain. I commend this motion to the House.